Hey folks, welcome back to our series of videos on heuristic evaluation. Um, if you recall from the last video, right, we talked, we introduced the idea of heuristic evaluation. We talked about how to execute a heuristic evaluation at a very high level. And we talked a bit about the history of heuristic evaluation. Um, in the next couple of videos, we're going to be getting into the real meat of um, this whole heuristic evaluation process, which is, which is going to involve digging into um, the heuristics themselves. Now you recall that you can use any list of heuristics that you want in heuristic evaluation, uh, but by and large, when people talk about heuristic evaluation these days, they're often referring to um, the procedure as well as a very well-known list of 10 heuristics uh, developed by Nielsen. We touched on this a bit in the last video. And these 10 heuristics are, one, flexibility and ease of use, two, uh, user control and freedom, uh, three, consistency and standards. We're going to go through all of these and then we'll dig into them in detail. Uh, four, uh, help users recognize, diagnose, and recover from errors. Five, uh, we want to match between the system and the real world. Six, uh, we talked about error prevention a bit in the last video. That's a big one. Seven, uh, visibility of system status. This is also a, a big one and, and a fun one to talk about. Eight, recognition rather than recall. 9, aesthetic and minimalist design, and then 10, help and documentation. So in this video, we're going to focus on these top four, and we'll do uh, the remaining six in the next couple of videos. Okay, let's start off uh, our exploration of these 10 heuristics with flexibility and ease of use. And all of these heuristics are um, uh, defined by Nielsen with a definition. Um, as you can see in this little note on the slide, I often find the definition captures the main gist of what um, people often talk about with each, each heuristic, but it doesn't capture everything. Uh, you might find that there's a problem that this definition doesn't cover um, that really fits under, for instance, flexibility and ease of use, uh, but, but isn't in the definition. That's totally okay. All right, with all that said, let's, let's uh, dig into this definition here. Flexibility and ease of use. Accelerators, um, unseen by the novice user, may often speed up the interaction for the expert user such that the system can, ca can uh, cater to both inexperienced and experienced users. Allow users to tailor frequent actions. So the key thing in this definition is this notion of accelerators. And uh, let's dig into this in more detail here. So what are these accelerator things? Well, uh, for example, let's, let's consider a desired action, which I execute all the time, especially when putting together slides for um, in-person classes, as well as, of course, the slides for this course. Um, so it, that, and that desired action is uh, taking a screenshot of an active window and copying it to the clipboard so that I can then copy it into um, my slides, or excuse me, paste it into my slides. So um, the most basic way to go about this is as follows, right? Um, I take a screenshot of the whole screen. I then uh, open up that screenshot in my favorite photo editor. This is preview on Mac. And I carefully select the outline of uh, the window that I'm interested in. I then go to the edit menu and I select copy. Wow, that's a lot of work. Now, if you're just doing this once, right, it's not a frequent action. Not a big deal, right? We can get over that. However, I do this on a weekly basis when I'm putting together lecture slides 20, 30, 40, 50 times. Uh, also when I'm putting together slides for research presentations, and that's gonna get really annoying. And this is where accelerators can come to the rescue for expert users like myself, right? A user who's, who's using, for instance, PowerPoint very often. Um, in this case, uh, the accelerator is a keyboard shortcut. So I can press Apple, Shift, Control, and 4, then Spacebar, then Enter, and I get a window uh, perfectly cropped um, that I can paste into PowerPoint or where, wherever and copy to my, my clipboard. This takes me um, a very small number of seconds, whereas the unaccelerated path takes me many seconds. And if we uh, analyze this using some of the other evaluation procedures that um, we're looking at in this uh, in this uh, course in our specialization, um, you can also tell that, for instance, with GOMS, the unaccelerated path is going to have just this massive list of actions, um, whereas uh, the accelerated path has a, a very small number. Um, in general, keyboard shortcuts make great accelerators. They're one of the most common accelerators that we interact with on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and that's because uh, they meet very clearly two, uh, parts of, uh, two key parts of this definition, right? They're unseen by the novice user. Uh, you can't really uh, discover keyboard shortcuts unless you look for them. There, are, there is some visibility, right? So if you look at the uh, menus, for instance, by copy, it says, you know, Apple C or Control C on Windows. Um, 
That kind of thing is important for a number of reasons, um, which we'll uh, get to in various aspects of um, this specialization, uh, but it's not uh, very, very visible, right? It's not something that, that's a big bar across the top of the screen, right? So for instance, on the iPad these days, you hold down the command key and it'll show you the list of keyboard shortcuts that are available in your application. That is very not visible and definitely accords with this uh, heuristic. And then of course, it, it also, keyboard shortcuts also speed up interaction, right? We saw that with a keyboard shortcut for um, uh, copying and pasting uh, screenshots. I do want to point out, though, that accelerators are definitely not just keyboard shortcuts. They um, can really fit into almost any process and almost any user interface design. Um, this is a great example here, uh, Amazon's one click, right? So if I, if I were to have clicked this button, I would have bought something and had it sent to my house. Um, no need to enter an address or a credit card number. Amazon already has it, right? These are accelerators, they're shortcuts. So why make me enter them over and over again for a frequent customer, uh, if given that I'm a frequent customer of Amazon that very often just sends, uh, buys things and sends it directly to my house, right? This is kind of Amazon's equivalent of a keyboard shortcut, um, but it, it is an accelerator in a different um, uh, a form. Another good one here is this the, the uh, favorites, the list of favorite folders that is both on Mac and Windows these days, right? You can customize them, you can drag them in. You can see we have our uh, MOOC madness form down there at the uh, folder down there at the bottom. I'm, I'm very frequent, uh, frequently these days um, entering stuff in that folder uh, to, uh, to prepare for this MOOC. So I have that over as an accelerator um, in, my, um, in my favorites list. Another great example um, are uh, uh, PowerPoint templates, right? So you'll, you'll notice that a lot of the fonts and um, the headers and opening slides are very similar across um, all of the uh, slides for this entire MOOC. That's because we've used an accelerator in the form of a PowerPoint template. And we're very grateful to the designers of PowerPoint that we don't have to manually customize every single slide so they look the same, right? There's an accelerator available um, for us. So through uh, this video and through the next couple of videos when we're going through um, our heuristics, I'm going to present positive examples, which I just did, right? Examples of user interfaces um, meeting the heuristic, right? They'd get a zero in our heuristic, heuristic evaluation scale. Um, but I'm also going to, uh, of course, present some negative, um, some negative examples. And uh, we'll do that here for, for flexibility and ease of use. I find that the negative examples are, are equally powerful in terms of their ability to um, communicate the idea behind each heuristic. And uh, uh, speaking of emoji here, right, um, on, on Mac, I think they, they do not meet this uh, heuristic with regard to entering emoji text, at least yet. Um, that we're, I think we're in Mac, Mac, 10 point, Mac OS 10.11 uh, when we get to 10.12, which might be out by the time you get this video. I think I heard that they, they've improved this. Um, but to enter an emoji on a Mac, you have to go to a, a menu, open a window, carefully select the emoji that you want, double click on it, right? That is a lot to, in to input a character. So if I were doing a heuristic evaluation on Mac OS, I would actually say, you know what, this is a problem. You know, it's emoji, it's not gonna start World War III, um, but it is something that people uh, type a lot. The emoji are things that people type a lot these days. Um, so we have that frequency dimension of our, um, our heuristic evaluation uh, severity scale, right? So I'm going to give this a two, right? So can we find a way to make it uh, easier to provide accelerators uh, for people entering emoji text? Um, a great example comes from uh, the, course, the course system or the course management system that we use here at the University of Minnesota. Um, uploading lectures, which I naturally do after every single lecture, so the slides for the lecture, maybe my course notes, um, takes about you know, five, ten clicks, three or four screens, these types of things, and it just simply drives me nuts because I do this so regu regularly and there's no accelerator. So if I were the designer of the system, which is, which is Moodle, I would, in the next version, uh, definitely include accelerators. And if I were the heuristic evaluator of the current system, I would say, you know what? Professors are an important part of our uh, user base. They very frequently uh, upload lectures, and it takes a zillion steps, and there's no accelerator. This is a pretty serious issue. I'm going to give this a three. Okay, so that's it for flexibility and uh, ease of use. Um, let's move on to our second heuristic, which is user control and freedom. And again, we have our definition from Nielsen here. So user control and freedom. Users often choose uh, system functions by mistake and will, ne and will need a clearly marked emergency exit to leave the unwanted state without having to go through an extended dialogue. Support undo and redo. Um, this last 
very, very small sentence really captures most of the user control and freedom heuristic. And people are generally pretty good at according to this heuristic, or systems are generally pretty good at according to uh, this heuristic these days. There's all sorts of um, undo everywhere, right? So you can do, these days you can undo copy and paste, uh, excuse me, you can undo moves in Apple's Finder, right? You can undo almost anything in most uh, sophisticated applications. Uh, the web has its own version of undo, which is the back button, right? Uh, and redo, which is the forward button. I'd say in general, uh, the back and forward button are used when uh, the uh, data that you're manipulating haven't, haven't changed. So you're just looking at another web page. You're just viewing the data in a different way. That's when undo and redo becomes back and forward. Whereas when you're actually manipulating the data, um, that's when you typically have this, this uh, uh, explicit undo and redo that are in the edit menu or have their according um, accelerators in the form of keyboard shortcuts. I will note there are some exceptions to this rule of um, this heuristic being followed very generally. And part of the reason that's the case is uh, oftentimes when you're going through heuristic evaluation, you're finding problems. Sometimes, even though they're very serious problems, uh, you and your design team will say, you know what? This is basically impossible to fix. We're just going to have to live with it, right? And one example uh, that I think is absolutely great um, in this respect is uh, email. So when I send an email, let's say I write to my boss here, dear boss, I don't like you very much. Also, I want a 200% raise now, right? And I sign it with my full name so my boss knows exactly who I am. If I hit send on this, um, there's no way for me to undo that, even though it's an incredibly important action, right? It's so important that I don't think this email address is actually live, but when I wrote this <laughs> email uh, to take a screenshot, I very carefully hit the red button and made sure not to save and not to send, right? Um, just because uh, sending an email like this can be incredibly powerful. And as a result, I would actually say the ability, uh, the lack of ability to undo emails in standard email interfaces is actually a four, very severe, because people can get themselves into very serious problems. I'm sure some of you while watching this video have done this, maybe not so intentionally. Um, and, uh, but unfortunately, the email protocol, it makes it very difficult to fix this problem. Right? So this is one of these things where it's a, it's a serious issue, um, but uh, we haven't seen it fixed over the last 15, 20 years when, when email has been active because it's very difficult to fix. Now, I will say, uh, there have been some efforts. One of my favorites is Google's uh, a supposed ability to unsend an email. What it basically does is it puts a delay on your email, right? It says, you know, um, we're not going to send your email for 10 seconds or 20 seconds, just in case you, you, you want a chance to reconsider. Let's say I'm just very angry at, at my job and I send that email. Then I think about my wife and, you know, how I need to, you know, make sure I save enough money for my family. Oh, you know what? I, that was a bad idea. I'm just going to, you know, be calm and, and uh, continue on in my job. Uh, if I had had this feature enabled in Gmail, um, I would be able to do so as long as I did, did that in 10, you know, 20 seconds, uh, these types of things. Another thing I think that's interesting is, is Snapchat might actually be a reaction to some of this, right? So um, in Snapchat, you can send a message and it, it disappears. That's, that's a form of undo, right? It's a, it's a reaction to the fact that email has this major failure in heuristic evaluation that has yet to be um, addressed. Um, okay, more generally, if you have a system that doesn't support undo and redo well, which is Although it's not common in, um, in commonly used applications, I should say it is somewhat common in sort of very specialized applications and certainly applications developed by um, naive developers, developers who haven't taken courses like this one. Um, you, can, you can end up with, in a situation where your users uh, feel like they're in a pottery barn. Here in the United States, you know, lots of, uh, we have this, th this notion of a pottery barn effect or a pottery barn principle where if you break it, you buy it, right? You walk into this fancy pottery barn store, it's a, it's, a, it's a chain of stores. You know, you're looking at an expensive bowl and you drop it. Well, you know, the, the story goes, you have to buy it. If you don't support undo and redo, your users will feel like they're walking around a pottery barn, right? They'll say, oh, I don't know if I can explore that feature, even though it's very important to me, because I can't undo it if I, if I do this, right? And it ends up having this dramatic chilling effect on, on, on user experience. And so while this, this uh, uh, heuristic is, is uh, more commonly followed these days. That's not to say that it's, it's unimportant, right? If, if you're designing a system, you really have to be careful about this um, and make sure that you're uh, adhering to this heuristic. All right, let's move on to heuristic number three, which is about consistency and standards. Um, 
So let's talk about Nielsen's uh, definition here. So Nielsen writes, uh, for this heuristic, users should not have to wonder whether different words, situations, or actions mean the same thing, follow platform conventions. This is a great example of how heuristic evaluation connects in with a lot of the other uh, um, topics we've been learning about in this specialization. Right? We talked about consistency in the last course. This is basically a heuristic that wraps a lot of those notions. Um, so for example, um, oh, if someone hits undo here, the standard, the convention, is that, um, is that it undoes the last action, right? Not the last five actions, not the last 10 actions, not the last half action, but the last action, right? If you violate that, that uh, convention, um, that can be a serious problem, can create a lot of confusion, um, as we talked about um, in the last uh, course. Same deal here, right? Right clicking in almost every, actually across both Windows and Mac and Ubuntu and these types of things, right? Right clicking brings up a contextual menu. It brings up a list of, of operations that are valid for um, the thing that you, you right clicked on. This is, this is a convention that if you did something else, it would create a great deal of confusion. So for instance, if you had right clicking to start drawing a line or to um, uh, you know, send an email somewhere, uh, that is going to um, uh, re that would receive a serious three or four in heuristic valuation because it it, it eliminates all the benefits of conventions and standards. Right, um, this heuristic is very very commonly followed these days. It's it's relatively rare in in frequently used applications to see dramatic violations of conventions. That said, again, by a naive developer or in specialized applications, you do encounter this um, uh, a decent amount. I was looking around, you know, at in the applications that I frequently use and trying to find an example of a relatively serious one um, in, a, in a sort of a, sor a short search, I couldn't find one. The one thing I, I did see was um, Firefox's, uh, the new versions of Firefox have this hamburger menu, um, which is unconventional in a desktop application, right? You frequently see them in web applications, but it's, it, you know, if you were, in fact, I probably did have a little bit of confusion um, when I first uh, saw that in, appear in Firefox. Um, just because I'm not expecting it in a desktop application. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to, you know, if I were a heuristic evaluator, I'd give this a one. Not a two because most of these functions are available in their standard places, and this is a standard in web applications. And of course, Firefox is a web browser. But that said, it's a, it's a, it is a desktop application at its core, and that, that is unexpected. So I would, I would mark this as a one in heuristic evaluation. OK, that's it for consistency and standards. Uh-oh, a heuristic evaluation fail in this slide itself. Um, I'm going to give that a 2 because uh, uh, that check mark looks a lot different than the other two check marks. Uh, this little um, silly little thing I, I put in here um, is just to remind me and uh, emphasize, to uh, remind me to talk about and to emphasize that when we're talking about consistency and standards, we're not just talking about interaction. We're also talking about appearance, right? Um, there are a number of reasons why that's important, um, which we uh, covered in the last specialization. So I'm going to fix this problem. Uh, you know, mark that as a two, right? Bad slide there, uh, Professor Hecht. Um, you have a, a heuristic evaluation issue in your slides. Mark that as a two, and let's fix that. All right, let's go ahead and, and uh, finish up here for this video with our last heuristic, which is uh, number four, right? Uh, and that is help users recognize, diagnose, and recover from errors. So this is the definition that Nielsen provides uh, for this heuristic. Uh, error messages should be expressed in plain language, no codes, uh, should precisely indicate the problem, and should constructively suggest a solution. And if you dig into Nielsen's writings a bit more, he provides five properties of good error messages that are emergent from this heuristic. Uh, the first property is that error messages should be obvious. It should be very clear that an error occurred, right? The second property is that error messages should use human readable language. This is sort of a direct response to this no codes notion, but goes beyond that, right? Uh, the error message should use language that your users will understand without any effort. Um, the third property here is that error messages should be precise. It shouldn't just say error. It should say specifically what happened. The error message should be constructive. This is an important one. It should sit, offer potential solutions, unless those solutions are very common sense solutions. And you have to be very careful about um, uh, guessing that people's common sense, users' common sense, um, uh, include some things that it, that it might not. And then lastly, um, error messages should be polite. No matter how frustrated you are when you're writing the error message, 
you need to be very polite to your users. So let's walk through a couple examples here. Um, this is a, an error message that I purposefully generated today. I typed in a URL at the University of Minnesota's website that I knew uh, didn't um, exist, and this is the error message that I got. And let's go through this. You know, is this error explicit? Yeah, it's very clear that uh, uh, something happened and that something was uh, an error, right? So that's very clear, at least to me. Um, second, does it use a human readable language? Yes and no, right? Not found? Well, what exactly are you talking about? Um, the, a very, very clear human readable language here would say, sorry, you know what, the, the web page that you typed in, you know, we don't have that web page. Uh, sorry about that, right? Um, you can see there is a little bit of that in the subtitle, but I think you need a little more for me to say, you know what, this property is definitely true in this error message. Is the error message precise? Uh, yeah, it says, you know, sorry, your URL was not found. Um, is it constructive? No, it isn't, right? It doesn't offer solutions uh, uh, for me, right? It doesn't say, maybe do you want to Google search um, this, this uh, UI MOOC thing plus UMN? Uh, do you want to go to the home page? These types of things. This error message is not constructive. And uh, lastly, I'd say um, it's reasonably polite. It doesn't say, hey, you know, you idiot, you typed in the wrong URL, right? So I'm going to give this a, a one as a heuristic evaluator, uh, just because it, it does an OK job. But I, I would prefer that uh, the error message be more constructive, definitely, and um, uh, probably more human readable as well. OK, let's move on to another error message here. This is an error message that you get on Google Flights when you uh, say you want to fly from, the, from one city to the same city. right? Your origin and destination are the same. It's a little small here, but you can say, you see it says here, sorry, flights between the uh, same city are not supported. So let's walk through um, our uh, five properties here. Is this explicit? Yep, it's very clear to me that an error occurred. Does it use human readable language? Sure, right? It could say error 707 uh, variable uh, dest uh, cannot equal variable um, origin, right? Instead, it, it, it expresses in very clear language what happened. Um, is it precise? Yep, it says exactly um, what, what the error is, right? Origin and the destination can't be the same. Is it constructive? Um, yes and no. I'm gonna, you know, I, I said yes just because I think this is common sense. You can make the argument that it could be more constructive, saying like, oh, did you, you know, mean a different city? Why don't you enter a different city? These types of things. Um, maybe we'll, you could argue that's a, a question mark, or you could say, you know what, that's pretty common sense. I know sometimes I'm, you know, if I'm searching for a flight, I'll, forget what, you know, just not be paying attention. And this one, I always know, you know, what to do next. Maybe that's not true for all users. And is it polite? Yeah, it's actually very polite. It says, sorry, right? Even though uh, you as the programmer might say, why is this stupid user entering, saying that they want to fly from the same place, start at the same place and end at the same place, right? Um, instead, uh, Google has a lot of smart people and they realize, you know what, calling your user stupid isn't the best idea. Let's, let's apologize, right? Um, OK, so in that case, since I put a check mark here uh, on all of these things, this isn't a problem. It's a 0. No, I would mark nothing on my heuristic evaluation. Um, but you could make the argument maybe it could be a little more constructive and give it a 1. All right, here's a, one of my favorite uh, old screenshots of a, an error message from Excel. I think we all uh, have encountered this uh, error message at some point. And, and let's walk through our five properties here. Um, is it explicit? Yeah, it's pretty explicit that an error occurred. Um, is this human readable? Definitely not, right? So even though I am a computer science PhD student, I don't quite uh, a priori know exactly what they mean by sort reference, right? I'm gonna have to figure out um, how their language matches my language and these types of things. Um, is it precise? Uh, not really, right? So which sort reference, you know, where, uh, where, which cell should I look at? These types of things. Is it constructive? Definitely not. It doesn't tell me what I need to do. If you get this error message, you have to say, you know what, I'm going to have to figure out how I can fix this uh, even though I'm given no suggestions, right? I have to explore on my own. And is it polite? Uh, I guess you could say maybe with the dog, <laughs> uh, but not valid. Uh, Nielsen talks a lot about how um, sort of invalid or illegal uh, these words uh, really shouldn't appear in um, uh, error messages, especially things like, you know, as you get more and more serious, illegal. That makes you feel like you did something really bad, right? Imagine, for instance, an older user might get, might get decently confused about that. Uh, so I would prefer this to say, you know, sorry, uh, we had a problem 
figuring out what's going on with your, your sort reference. Um, just to fix that, uh, the polite issue. Obviously, uh, that error message that I just suggested wouldn't fix human readable language or precise or constructive. OK, in this case, because there are so many problems with this, and I think we've all encountered it before, it's relatively common. I would give this a 2. OK, and then here's, here's the last one, uh, the check engine light um, in uh, probably many of your cars. Uh, let's walk through uh, this error message with respect to Nielsen's heuristics. Um, is it explicit? Uh, maybe, maybe not, right? It's pretty small. For an engine potential engine failure, I would like something really big to show up, right? This, could, this personal safety uh, is, is an issue here. So I would prefer this to be uh, uh, much bigger for me to give this a check mark. Um, human readable language? Uh, yeah, you know, that maybe looks like an engine and does say check, uh, but it, it could do a better job. So I'm going to say maybe, but, but probably not. Uh, is this precise? Definitely not. There are about 150 different uh, problems that could be going on. And really, the only thing you know to do at this point is maybe bring it to a mechanic who can then figure out what this actually means. This is, in some ways, the definition of imprecise. Um, is it constructive? Definitely not. It should at least say, go to a mechanic. Maybe it should say, uh, you know, your oil, uh, there's an issue with your oil, these types of things. Why don't you change your oil? This is definitely not constructive. And is it polite? I would actually say no, right? Uh, this is a worrying uh, issue. When you see the check engine line, it's like, yikes. Um, it's at least a major inconvenience, maybe a personal uh, safety risk. Uh, I would prefer to say, you know, uh, I'm sorry, something along the lines of, I'm sorry to inform you of this, but there's something wrong with the engine. Uh, you really, uh, I really highly recommend that you go to a mechanic as soon as possible, right? So this could be made much more polite. And because of the seriousness of this issue, uh, the potential impact both uh, commercially, I think, and uh, uh, well, maybe not commercially, at least for the user, uh, I would actually give this, give this a three, right? We, um, we would want to see check engine lights um, be much more um, human readable, uh, precise, constructive, polite, and I would actually say explicit as well um, in the future. And you're starting to see this happen, right? People are developing apps that plug into car computers that can actually solve some of these issues. And one of the main appeals of these apps is that it actually addresses uh, this problem that uh, probably comes up in any heuristic evaluation that you would do of a, a dashboard panel here. All right, uh, that's it for our four heuristics for this video. Uh, we'll continue on um, with uh, uh, heuristics 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10. Uh, see you then.